So welcome uh, to our afternoon webinar. This is Data Classroom U in the University Classroom. And we're, we're really gonna be looking at um, how a tool can support pedagogy for college level learners. Um, this has been a relatively new area for Data Classroom. We've been involved with, with K-12 education uh, for about six years, and, and it's really only been about the last two that we've been uh, working in the university space. And um, we have some special guests with us today who have all um, taught students to work with data and who have all used Data Classroom U in their courses. So we're gonna we're gonna hear um, from them today. Um, and maybe we'll just uh, we'll start out with um, some introductions. And I'll just go in the order that they are appearing on my on my Zoom screen. Um, so uh, first guest that we have with us today is Dr. Ian Clifton. Um, from the University of Arkansas at Little Rock. And uh, Ian earned his uh, PhD at the University of Toledo. He did a postdoctoral fellowship at uh, Florida International University. And he's currently uh, assistant professor of biology at the University of Arkansas at Little Rock. Uh, he studies evolutionary ecology, particularly with amphibians and reptiles, and their responses to rapidly changing environments. Ian, thank you for being uh, here with us. And I'm just going to ask you one quick introductory question. Um, what? How did you learn to work with data, and what was the experience like for you personally? Uh, I really didn't do much of any data work until I started my graduate degree. So... Um, the usual axioms as an undergrad, but not really any understanding of what I was doing. Yeah, I, th I think that's so typical. I, I definitely feel like I didn't get my introduction uh, uh, properly in, until until grad school as well. So thanks for being here. Uh, thanks yeah. for having me. Sure. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Or Dr. Megan Coviella. She earned her PhD at the University of Minnesota. Um, she did a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Nebraska, and she is currently an assistant professor of biology at Sweetbriar College here in my current home state of Virginia. Um, Megan studies how animals uh, navigate in, in toxic world, and lately she's been studying butterfly populations and their response to everything from plant defenses to heavy metals to pesticides. Thank you for being with us here today, Megan. And as an intro, uh, how did you learn to work with data and what was the experience like for you? Yeah, so I think in terms of working with large data sets, definitely not until grad school, but in terms of small data sets, like writing up lab reports um, in high school with Excel, which was a dicey experience for sure. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah, the the Excel experience is, for so many of us was the, was the first foray uh, in into data, um, and it, it has some good, but it also has some things that are tough uh, there as well. So thanks for being with us here today, Megan. And uh, last but not least, we have uh, Dr. Dan Warner, um, currently at Auburn University. Dan did his PhD at the University of Sydney. Uh, he did a postdoctoral fellowship at Iowa State University. He's currently an associate professor of biological sciences at Auburn, and he studies how organisms interact with their environment across multiple life history stages, ranging from embryos to adults, and those organisms are often reptiles. Uh, thanks for uh, being here with us today, Dan. And how did you learn to work with data? Um, well, pretty much the same as what Ian and Megan mentioned, though most of it came in as a grad student. but. Uh, as undergrad, I worked a little bit um, in Excel and really just calculating averages and looking at using that summary statistic. Yep. Yep. I, I often think of uh, averages as like the, the bridge to real stats because it, it's sort of like when you start working with averages, then you then as a student, you start to get an idea that variance matters. Uh, and and uh, that's that's often the, the first thing kids do when they start uh, learning statistics. So um, so just to kind of go over what we're going to do here in the rest of this session, um, we're, we've, we've gotten through our introductions. Uh, I want to do a quick demo of, of DCU and talk about um, 
some of the some of the design behind it. And this is particularly uh, for people who might be new to our webinar series and who might be new to DCU. Um, but then most of the time we're, we're going to have a conversation about um, teaching undergrads to work with with data. Um, just kind of a quick background. If you are new um, to data classroom, I was my name is Aaron Reedy. I was formerly a high school teacher in the Chicago Public Schools. I left the classroom to uh, work on a PhD in biology at the University of Virginia. Um, along the way, I started working on Data Classroom and got some help from the iLab program and the Catalyst program at University of Virginia's um, business school. And we... we uh, released the first version of Data Classroom to a K-12 audience. And we we did just that for a couple of years. But then we started thinking um, about how undergrads learn to work with data and, and realized that a lot of what we had learned in making the K-12 version of Data Classroom would actually be helpful in making a tool specifically for undergrads. So I wanna, I wanna talk about some of these, well, I guess one more slide about what what does Data Classroom do, and then and then we'll talk about some of the problems that we're working on. But Data Classroom is a tool for uh, graph making. It's a tool to make data analysis generally more accessible, and uh, it also provides a bridge to statistical programming in R and more recently uh, Python as well. So that's just kind of a quick uh, summary of of what our tools do. Um, some problems that we try to address with the tool that I think are different than other um, data or statistical tools that students might use. Um, some of these, one of these problems is that um, data presentations that that show only summary statistics, so kind of like the the bars on the far right of this, or the the far rightmost panel, um, those can be problematic for learners because they can obscure the variance that is, lies behind those bars. And when you look at a figure like the one all the way on the left, where you can see individual data points, um, research tells us that you have just a much better understanding of, of the variance involved. And so with Data Classroom, we like students to start with a figure like the one on the left. And if they wanna make one on the right, we want them to go through steps that are explicit and clear as they as they produce a figure like that, um, one one of uh, another general principle is that the idea data tool for learning is not necessarily the tool that's the easiest to use, but one that makes things clear for the learner. And there's there's lots of different ways that we we bring this principle into data classroom. Um, one potential solution is to animate the math behind um, statistical tests so that you can see where the quantities used in the calculations are coming from. And we, we do that at certain places in the, in the web app. Um, in other places in the, in, the, in the web app, we try to, to uh, give the student kind of key pop-ups that enhance understanding right at the place where they might need it. And another example is that is when Students are going from graph to statistical test. We try to show them tables that show the logic behind a choice of a statistical test, as well as a pop-up that's sort of like a handy paragraph from a textbook sort of right at the point when you might be wondering, you know, how does this test work or why am I using this test in, in this situation? Um, and then finally, uh, kind of one last problem that I'll touch on before I just show a little bit of the app is that um, acknowledging this fact that learners and experts alike employ internet searching to find code that's relevant when they're doing an unfamiliar task. This phenomenon is uh, well studied and it, it's in the literature it's called web foraging. But what this really is, is Googling for the code that you need when you're trying to work with, with data. And um, the, it can be very effective for experts, but for learners, it's often tough because they often don't have enough vocabulary to actually efficiently find the code that they're looking for. And so we've tried to provide a bridge to that um, within Data Classroom 
to give them to give them the code that they need when they need it and when they're when they're trying to find it. And so um, with that, let me just uh, stop my screen share for one second and I'm going to pull up um, data classroom and just show you a bit of that. And go back to my screen share. Okay, so this this is the data classroom tool. And this is this is what our dashboard looks like. I'm gonna really quickly just pull an example data set um, from our library. Um, for example, I'll take this, how did they get the, the blues? And this is gene expression data from Scoloporus lizards. Um, and I'm just opening this, this data set and I wanna show you some of those principles in, in action. So we're looking at the data set itself here. I'm gonna go over to the graph and maybe we will compare um, gene expression of let's say this IGF-2 gene and we can see different expression levels here and we can compare this by by treatment and you know the story behind the data is not necessarily in important here um these were the control or the testosterone group is lizards that were uh uh treated with supplemental testosterone um and in comparing these two groups we're just looking at data points so each observation is its own point this is kind of you know where we would like students to start when they're asking a question of a data set. And then we might want them to add something like averages. So if we go ahead and add descriptive statistics here, we've got mean and standard deviation, or maybe we wanna look at mean and 95% confidence interval. And if we wanna launch a statistical test from here, we could use this graph-driven hypothesis test button and we can see that this is recommending a t-test. We're assuming a normal distribution here. We've got two categories on X. We've got a numeric variable on Y. And we can go ahead and before we get results of that, we can look at a, a pop-up of why are you using the t-test? Um, how does it work? It's weighing signal against noise. And, and we can go ahead and we can get statistical output um, for that test. In this case, there's no evidence that there's that the groups might be different at all. We've got a p-value of 0.55 um, in this case. This also to show you how you can bridge to coding in R or Python. If I um, use this try in R feature, uh, I can get the code right here to make our figure in R, or the other tab will give me the code to run the statistical test. Um, and you can see this is this is a the closest approximate figure in R. Um, and students can take this code, they can drop it into to R Studio or wherever they're working with R and use that as a as a bridge. So this is just kind of a very, very, very quick demonstration of of how we've put some of those principles um, into practice uh, within the app itself. And um so now we'll kind of come back and we'll just kind of talk about, um, you know, using using the data classroom tools, but also just teaching students to work with data um, in general. And sorry. So let's let's discuss what's what's happening um, in classrooms, particularly the the classrooms of our of our special guests here. Um, so maybe I can uh, just start out with. Um, maybe we'll start with Megan first. Um, Megan, what what course did you use Data Classroom you in, and and just kind of describe the data work in that in that class? Yeah, so I've actually used um, Data Classroom in two separate courses. Um, first is our first semester um, intro bio, which is intro to organisms at our school. Um, and then the second is actually a non-majors class um, that everyone has to take called Decisions in a Data-Driven World. And Data Classroom has been super useful in both contexts. Um, in the intro bio context, um, 
when I first started teaching here, I inherited a lab um, that I, I really enjoyed um, from uh, the person who I replaced, who was retiring, who also worked with butterflies. And she had a really great setup where um, we got the students in the lab collecting data on butterfly feeding preferences. And she had a really nice, um, you know, step-by-step -step process in Excel to get them to make graphs and start thinking about the data. Um, but after interacting with Aaron, um, I realized that, you know, and, and my experiences in the classroom trying to teach Excel, um, big challenge being that, you know, some students have Macs, some students have PCs, some people are trying to use Google Sheets, some people are trying to use numbers. And I was spending all my time troubleshooting people's individual machines instead of teaching them data. Um, and so Aaron was able to take um, the materials I already had and then adapt that lab for um, my course. And the students have a much easier time. I have a much easier time as that first, first foray into data. Um, the um, Decisions in a Data-Driven World class, um, I am really um, pulling a lot from the amazing data sets and activities that are already pulled into Data Classroom. Um, instead of students collecting data de novo, they are just learning about, you know, what can data do in all of these different fields. Um, so um, when Aaron showed, like, just opened up Data Classroom, I've... Um, that um, example about costumes, gray and Halloween costumes um, was really applicable to my business students. Um, and they loved working with that data. There's sports data in there. So I'm pulling, you know, able to pull more people into um, understanding why data is important. Even if they're not a biologist like me, I can use those tools to, you know, show them how useful it is in other fields. That's always been one of my favorite things about teaching a, a class that's data focused and not necessarily topic focused because you can really hit just about anybody's interest through data. It's just like kind of a way to ask questions about the world. Um, and that's that's really cool. And um, Dan, how about you? Wh which classes have you used data classroom in and what was the what was the data work like in those courses? Sure. Yeah. So I've had. Um... Well, four, four of my courses have used Data Classroom now. Um, three of them, one's our vertebrate biology class, one's our herpetology class, so study of rep reptiles and amphibians, and then another one is a, like a, a tropical ecology class, all of which, those three classes all have components where the students have to do research projects, and they're usually upper level undergraduate students. And so, um, so some of these students have had um, a statistics class in the past, but their understanding is very all over the place. Um, uh, most of really don't, didn't understand, or at least they, I get the impression they didn't understand what they really learned in the previous statistical classes they've taken. Um, but so what, what's really nice, um, well, I, I backtrack a second. Most, most students have really started, uh, ha have only uh, a small experience working with with Excel and entering data into Excel. And, um, and that was something uh, that, you know, we, when we're entering data, we, uh, I often have the students enter data into Excel. And one of the things that um, they really liked is how easy it is to bring in data from Excel or from say Google Sheets right into data classroom. And that was something that a lot of them had, had, um, had uh, commented on that they really found nice, um, but uh, um, one of the approaches that we what, that we take is giving the students a chance to explore data that had previously been collected before they jump into their own research project, and uh, so they have a, access to a data set, and they really uh, found it nice and easy to graph different variables on X, the X and Y axis so they can explore things on their own. And they didn't have that sort of capacity in, in the past classes that they've taken. Um, they didn't know enough to, 
to really explore things. Yeah. Dan, when you were talking about the, they commented on like the, the ease of bringing data in from other, from spreadsheets. Do you think that was that in, in direct comparison to like, say, trying to bring in data to R or SPSS or some other program? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and, and many of them, well, have never done it before, but the ones that had, um, they, they found the simple sort of he had several different options of doing it from cutting and pasting to just uploading mm -hmm. uh, directly from a, a Google sheet. Um, it's really efficient for them. Yeah, that's that's cool to hear. And and not totally surprising to me because I feel like it's it's those little things like the logistics of working with data that aren't they don't necessarily appear in a stats class, but they're actually really big stumbling blocks when you when you you know try to get students working with data. And and Ian, how about you? Which which courses did you use Data Classroom in and what was the data work like? Yeah, so I've just started using it this semester um, for my Principles of Ecology um, lab. Uh, so anybody doing like our ecology and organismal biology has to go through this lab. <clears throat> um, and we are just getting to the stage where we've collected our own data and they're going to start working with it. So I've been using Data Classroom to Get familiar myself so I can show them. Um, but we started out with, you know, the preloaded data sets um, to get them familiar with using Data Classroom. And also a lot of them are really applicable to like ecological questions. So like there was a whole data set for um, biodiversity uh, and we had just gone out and done a biodiversity survey. Um, but our campus is not particularly biodiverse. So we were able to use this data set to look at, you know, how um, things like evenness and richness affect diversity. Um, and I didn't even think about this point that Megan brought up about figuring out individual computer issues. And I forget how much time that ends up taking up when I'm teaching these labs. So that is uh, a benefit that I had not even considered. Um, you know, students are giving me pretty decent, um, pretty decent graphs uh, when they understand what they're doing. We're still working on that, but um, you know, it takes some of the guesswork out. They can start to look at that exploratory stuff. You know, I loaded in some of their data uh, before this just to kind of see what we had gotten and also, you know, get a feel for it. And it's very easy to explore the data. So even like I'm very proficient at R, very proficient at Excel. Data Classroom is still uh, quicker, more user friendly. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm really looking forward to them working with it and also expanding into bigger, longer term projects um, with those students. Cool. And then this is this is a question um, for for discussion here. But what you know in your experiences throughout your your careers as educators and as researchers. Um, you know, what do you think the biggest challenges are in in getting undergrads to work with with data? I'll say one thing is is, um, and this is true when I was an undergrad too. I it was really hard to uh, remember without having a long uh, long background with statistical analyses, remembering what the um, appropriate tests would be for uh, certain types of data. And um, and my students struggle with that. Um, we go over and over and over, and it, there's always some that just don't quite understand what test is used when you have a, a categorical dependent variable or a categorical independent variable versus a continuous. Um, and uh, and the students liked in data classroom that the the, the figures you generate uh, recognize the type of data. Yeah, that you have, and uh, and then you know, it, you know, the, the some of them rely on that heavily. And they all pretty much rely on that heavily. But it's nice that there's an explanation for why those types of analyses were are performed for those types of data. Yeah, yeah. It 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 all. I hope too that it it can like demystify it because there does. I, I I don't know why, but for whatever reason, there seems to be like everyone when they're learning stats is like a little bit self-conscious of like, you know, did I pick the right thing? Did I do the right thing? And they're like, they, it almost this, it keeps them from, I think sometimes it's jumping in and and doing stuff. And 
the stress can kind of, I don't know, it makes, it makes learning harder. It can inhibit it. And it's nice to lay it out and say like, you know, it's, it's really, it's a, it's a series of simple algorithms in, is in, in, you know, in what statistical test fits in what situation. And I hope that's one thing we can help, help students realize uh, even if they are relying on it uh, at, at times, maybe more than you, than you'd like them to. Yeah, I think just in terms of the visualization and in my um, but intro bio class, I haven't really had them dig into statistical analyses. Um, you know, first semester freshman, um, the school I work at is an all women's college. And unfortunately, I see a lot of lack of math confidence in our population. Um, but I think what's really resonated with them in terms of statistical tests when um, I introduced just basic concepts like statistical significance in uh, my non-majors class has been those tools that are embedded in data classroom, like visualizing the p-value, right? So they there's students that might come in and have had to calculate a p-value by hand in some capacity, but they don't understand what that means. But being able to actually click on a data set and a group of points and say, okay, I think the I think the mean is here, I think the variability is here, um, really gives them a lot more confidence um, because again, it's so scaffolded and so visual. And I think it it helps them um, get over a little bit of that lack of math confidence a lot easier than, you know, typing things in R. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I think for me, the visualization has been really helpful. A lot of what we do in our ecology labs is we just go out and we measure a bunch of stuff um, just to, you know, this is probably related to this, this is probably related to that. And it gives them an opportunity to think about it, um, the data in an exploratory way, thinking about how, you know, it takes some of the guesswork out of, just having a spreadsheet and trying to figure out which figure they need to use or which type of graph they're able to kind of more effectively uh, explore those data look for potential problems in the data um, which i think is really beneficial and along with that scaffolding comment the i think the p-value is something that's always really daunting with undergraduates especially if it's like the first time that they've heard it um and just anecdotally, I have not had any issues with people getting really tripped up and confused about it. Um, and it seems, you know, talking about those preloaded data sets, when we start talking, when they start looking at the, um, the uh, what is that, the data analysis um, extension, they are very confident when they tell me, oh, yeah, what well, my answer was right or my answer was wrong for this reason. Mm -hmm. um, which is not something I've necessarily experienced in past classes where I have to teach them how to do like a t-test in Excel. Cool. So where now, like you all are doing cool things in your classes with, with data. Um, what, you know, what are your ideas for things you'd like to do in, in future courses? I know you might not be seeing beyond the end of the semester at this point, but like, what, what would ideal work with data look like in your, in your course? Uh, I, I can, I've been thinking about it a lot, I guess. Um, so one thing that I would like to do, because this is the first time I've taught this principles of ecology lab, I was starting from scratch, um, building these data collection in a way that we can build onto a data set throughout the semester. So we can start to address these questions as you know, iterative or expanding. So students start early in the semester and then they can put those data collaboratively into, you know, sheets and put it directly in the data classroom or um, put it directly in however we decide to do it. Um, you know, sheets is really convenient for that. And with data classroom, you can pull directly from sheets. Um, but trying to expand a semester long data set um, addressing specific questions. In our case, it's mostly about diversity and um, soil ecologies because uh, that's something easy to measure. Um, but yeah, trying to get students to think about the interconnectedness in ecology through um, these different parameters that don't necessarily seem related uh, initially. And as we go on, build into that. 
Mm -hmm. And also, I should say, while while um, our guests are responding, if anyone has any questions, feel free to drop those uh, in the chat, and I'll I'll make sure to to bring those. And Megan, I should also say we have a participant who uh, wishes she uh, had access to your decisions in a data driven world class, <laughs> like like the sound of that. Yeah, but uh, Megan and Dan, what do you do? You have any kind of yeah, just like kind of future ideas or or goals or things you'd like to explore with with data in your in your courses? Ian Ian was a good one to to answer that because he's a relatively new professor, so he's <laughs> thinking about what what's coming next. Uh, perhaps more than you guys are. I don't know. Um, well, one thing that I'm I've been always trying to improve on in my classes um, and it's something that students often struggle with is coming up with good hypotheses and predictions and and it's not always an easy concept to for students to distinguish between what their hypothesis is and their prediction is and and the prediction is nice to um, sort of formulate using, data classroom from a visual perspective. Um, like they, uh, where, where I'm going with this is that, uh, you, you know, it's not actually doing the statistical analyses, it's giving them the problems. It's, it's getting to the point where, um, uh, where they know what they're supposed to analyze in the first place. And if, and I try to have students draw out a figure by, by hand uh, what a prediction would be based on what their hypothesis is. And uh, in a lot of cases, the data might be available for the type of previous work that we've done in some of my classes uh, for them to draw out those predictions with Data Classroom. And I'm trying to improve on that a little bit with certain sort of mock data sets that I provide um, for them to uh, to work with a little bit more that might be focused a little bit on the types of questions that they would be asking in the classroom, if yeah. that makes sense. Yeah, it's it's interesting to hear that idea from you, Dan. And it's, it's actually kind of validating because I this last semester I taught um, a class to graduate students at, at UVA, but they were not necessarily um, scientists. They were from, they were like art historians and uh, religious studies and that, you know, but it, uh, one of the exercises that we did in that class was I would have students draw me uh, like a cocktail napkin sketch of a graph. Like I don't care about numbers, but show me what data would look like if your hypothesis was supported and then draw me another one that would show what it would look like if your hypothesis was not supported. And I, I was not prepared at first for how hard that would be for, for them to do. Cause there's a lot that there's, there's like, you know, you have to do some graph choice. You have to think about how data translates to a figure, but it, it felt like a very productive exercise. Like at, at the end of that, they like really had an idea where they were going. Um, and, and it sounds like you're kind of doing something similar, um, with, with your students. And, um, yeah, I think it's, it's good. It's also, it's also interesting to think about, you know, what role does like pencil and paper sketching kind of play in a world where we're graphing stuff digitally. And I, I really think it's like best for when it's, um, you know, speeding up the efficiency of communicating an idea where the number, the exact numbers don't matter so much. Um, but yeah. Yeah. So, um, like I said, I haven't used data classroom yet in a more advanced class, just the way my teaching has been working in like different foci of the more advanced classes I'm teaching, but I am teaching um, animal behavior for the first time uh, next semester. And that's going to be a sophomore and junior level class. And so as I'm designing that, I'm thinking about, um, you know, what are some of the learning goals that I want them to achieve in a course where, you know, is extremely data heavy field, but we don't have a lab. Um, and so trying um, a lab section to really get into data, but still, I, I think in my experiences over the last couple of years, it's become apparent to me that people, they need practice with data all the time. Right? <laughs> and so figuring out ways to incorporate like small publicly available data sets or 
um, a small activity where they're maybe getting on one of the um, Cornell, um, you know, webcams that are showing a feeder and collecting like small bits of data that then we can um, talk about um, basic statistics in um, an animal behavior context. And hopefully since, you know, a lot of the students that are um, going in that class are just really excited about the topic. Hopefully that will help them make a couple more connections with why these types of statistics are important to help answer questions more so than they would experience at a lower level class. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Megan, maybe I could, I could bounce this off you too, like thinking even, you know, even bigger picture, what, do you have any opinions on what you think are the most important data skills that an undergrad should leave their college education with? Or Ian or Dan, you can, you can jump in on that and not to just put yeah. you out there. I mean, I think it's amazing that you guys brought up the like, be able to just quickly scratch your graph and thinking in terms of your results. Um, that's something that I try um, in this lab series in my intro class to have them, you know, sketch graphs by hand at first so that they're, um, you know, thinking in terms of the end product. I think that is absolutely huge in, in being able to like really quickly think graphically, I think goes a really long way. Um, and I think, um, uh, being able to, um, organized data in a way that's effective for actual <laughs> analysis is another really big thing um, that's going to be a transferable skill going into the future. Um, and of course, basic statistics, but knowing where you need to go in order to, um, you know, figure out what test is going to best fit your data, I think would be the three, the three skills I'd come up with. Yeah, I'm. I'm not exactly sure what what my answer would be, but so that uh, I think it's definitely like the ability to 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 think big picture, like to to not necessarily mechanics, but to know like how to frame a question. You know, does does particular data answer it or not? Um, how about you, Ian or Ian or Dan? Uh, I think one thing that I would like my students to take is kind of just some graphing literacy. Um, a lot of them are not necessarily going to be in positions where they're making the decisions about which test to use, or maybe they're not going to be presented with those kinds of data. But being able to look at just a figure and get have a, a pretty solid understanding of what it is that they're looking at and what it is that they're showing them, rather than having to read like the caption that someone wrote about what it's showing them or the words so that they can assess things more critically rather than just taking it at face value. Um, and, I, you know, that's one of the things that I really like with the um, way that classroom is set up with the transparency, with putting all the points and then putting the summary statistics on it. Um, and I think that that really can help students, regardless of what field it is they go into. Yeah, I, I agree with all those points. I mean, one thing that I would like students to understand more is, well, um, I mean, we live we live in a society, I guess, where people like to have yes, no, or want black and white answers to everything. And um, by looking at you know, doing statistical analyses and visualizing the data, there's variance everywhere. You know, not everyone responds the same way. Not every treatment has the same effect at every individual the same way. So by looking at how things vary, you can and, and understanding the the importance of a p-value, you know, the probability of of supporting this or that. It's not that we're, you know, my students oftentimes use this, the word we prove this hypothesis correct. You know, we're not proving it. We're just giving or assigning it a probability that it um, that it's a probability that it's that it's correct. Or um, and uh, and it might hopefully and hopefully it gives the students a better perception of how science proceeds and how we interpret. Um, the type of work that we do, uh, and it's uh, it's not always black and white. Yeah, yeah, that's you're absolutely right. Science science isn't equipped to give yes or no answers. It just gives degrees of confidence. Yeah, um, yeah, that that was a that was a good good uh, point to make there. Um, yeah, well, uh, I guess I want to just if there is if anyone does have a question. 
um, that they haven't dropped in the chat. If anyone has a question that they want to ask, this would probably be the the time to do it uh, before um, we wrap up. Um, I want to say uh, thank you to all three of you, um, and um, you know, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedules to do this. And thank you to all of you who um, tuned in live, and thank you to all of you who are taking time to watch this on the recording uh, as well. I appreciate.